All right, everyone. This is uh, this is Pete Spear from Covestic. Thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, the topic is uh, I'm implemented now. What, uh, which is really focused on maintaining a healthy ServiceNow instance after after your go live and some of the staffing elements uh, around uh, maintaining an instance and, and staffing a team to support your ServiceNow environment. My name is Pete Spear. I'm the, uh, I'll be sort of moderating the uh, webinar today. Um, my role at Covestic is Director of Business Development for the West. Um, I've been with Covestic for over four years now and have been responsible for business development and account management in the ITSM ServiceNow space uh, for the West. And uh, I'm happy to have you all join us today. Thanks. Just, just a bit about Covestic for, you, for those of you who don't know who we are. We, uh, we're based in Kirkland, Washington. We've been around since 2001. Uh, we've been delivering ser uh, services nationwide. Uh, we have about 200 plus folks, uh, mainly senior level consultants with an average of about 14, uh, 15 years of professional co consulting experience. Um, we have three major lines of business. Uh, our IT operations services practice focuses on uh, developing and standardizing IT operations environments, including cloud and uh, enterprise infrastructure environments, including security operations and, and other applications administrations. Uh, our project delivery services focus on providing project leadership to uh, very complex IT projects. Um, we have a long history of project management uh, that in, it really ensures compliance, quality, and timing of project delivery. And then finally, our service uh, management, uh, service now practice focuses on um, assessment work, um, implementation work, and uh, ServiceNow work, as, as, you, as you may know. And ServiceNow is the only tool that we work with. So um, across the, the vast you know, landscape of ServiceNow tools, we only work with ServiceNow. Uh, we've performed over 100 ServiceNow projects uh, with an average CSAT score of over 9. And we have about a 90, over 90% 90 uh, recurrence rate with, uh, with our clients. Uh, here's a, a depiction, just a, a few, few of the companies we work with. Uh, it, this spans across the country, of course. Uh, we have a focus on, on the West uh, for, from my standpoint, but also across the country with, with many large enterprise organizations uh, across many industries from manufacturing to government to telco uh, to uh, state and local as well. The agenda today will we'll cover three topics. We'll focus on building a product roadmap and what that means uh, for developing your, your long-term ServiceNow objectives. Uh, we'll discuss best practices around uh, defining an SDLC and discuss the staffing considerations and a few models around how to staff a team to maintain a ServiceNow, a healthy ServiceNow environment and a healthy instance. Um, this should provide some ideas and, and a few different models that may or may not fit your needs um, and we can always, you know, work with you ongoing to tweak those items uh, and some of these uh, models for your particular environment. Please feel free to ask any questions. There's a, there's a Q&A uh, session after Michael's presentation, um, but we definitely want your feedback and we can answer some of those questions ongoing. So just take note of some of the material as we go through this and uh, feel free to ask, answer any questions or ask any questions and we'll be happy to either follow up on this call or, or after this call with you directly. Uh, I'll turn, turn it over now to Michael Yee. He's one of our sol uh, senior solution architects for Covestic. Uh, Michael will be delivering the majority of the content today. So Michael, uh, please proceed. Great, thank you, Pete. Uh, glad everyone can make it today. Uh, again, my name is Michael Yee, and I'm gonna be the host for today's webinar. As Pete said, I am a solutions architect with Covestic. I'm based out of Southern California. I've uh, been with Covestic about five years and been working with the ServiceNow platform uh, since around 2007 timeframe, first as a customer and the last six years as a consultant. In terms of my consulting projects, I've done over 50 ServiceNow projects providing design, delivery assurance, as well as delivery. So today's topic you want to get into is you've implemented ServiceNow. Now what? So this is a great topic, and really where I came up with the origin of this topic really started with a conversation I had with one of my customers several years ago. It started off with a simple question where one of my customers asked me, you know, what size does my team need to be? And as a consultant, my classic response was, well, it depends. And his response on, it depends on what? That's when I came up with this particular slide, and you kind of see this graphic here on the right. 
this is a this is what I developed during the conversation. This concept between the product roadmap, the SDLC, and the staffing, which I want to kind of share with you today, because this really talks about the different types of components that really is going to influence what type of staffing model uh, that you should adopt. And we'll go through uh, each topic in detail. I first had this conversation, as I said, it was in Vegas, actually in one of the previous knowledge conferences a few years back. And I put this analogy in terms of a Vegas buffet. And if anyone hasn't been to Vegas before or eaten the buffet at Vegas, uh, Vegas is known for their you know, rather large or insane number of uh, items that you have on their buffet. If you haven't had a chance to eat one, you should try. And if you haven't had a chance, you may have an opportunity next May when ServiceNow has their annual Knowledge 18 conference out there to try one of their, uh, their crazy buffets. So what does this really have to do with staffing and the product roadmap? Really, when you go to a Vegas buffet or when you build your, your, um, your staffing model, it's really about strategy. You, what you want to do is you want to develop a strategy because when you go to a Vegas buffet, they have literally hundreds of items in which you can choose to eat and there's no way which you could possibly eat all of them. So the idea behind that is you really want to develop a strategy, prioritize items, where am I going to go to first, and really kind of figure out what's important to you and what's not. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today in terms of different staffing options. So the first thing which I want to talk about is you know the product roadmap and the product roadmap is really about being able to prioritize what is what it is that you want to do as an organization what do you want to focus on what are, are those items which that you're going to be uh, implementing either in the new future or in the distance future. And this is really about selecting which items on the buffet that you want to put into your roadmap and say you know this is what we're going to be uh, to be focusing on. The second thing which we're going to be focusing on is the SDLC, and this is really your strategy on how to execute your product roadmap. And if we go back to our Vegas um, buffet analogy, some people will have the strategy of grabbing multiple plates at a time and bring it back to, bring it back to their table, while other people will take one plate at a time. And the idea behind the SDLC is figure out what is that cadence in terms of what are we going to do in order to grab those roadmap items and implement them. Are we trying to do a bunch of them at a time? Are we going to be very strategic? Are we going to group them together? And that's what we'll really talk about in the SDLC. And the last thing which we want to talk about, excuse me, sorry, is staffing. Uh, staffing is really going to be making sure you have the correct resources in order to uh, support your SDLC and your roadmap. And if we go back to our to our buffet analogy, this is, well, am I getting food for everyone at the table or am I just getting it for myself? Because if you're grabbing dessert for everyone at the table, you're going to be grabbing more as opposed to just kind of doing it as an individual. So you really need to know what resources you have available as, as well as what resources which you uh, are going to need. The challenge which we have is that even if you do define this, your product roadmap and the requirements you have on there, your velocity, and we'll talk about what that means in terms of the STLC, as well as your staffing, these will constantly change over time. Uh, you have staff members who uh, will get diverted to other projects or may leave the company. You may have pre-prioritization in terms of roadmap items. Uh, you may find that your SDLC cadence needs to be adjusted upwards or downwards. So it's also key to keep in mind that you need to come up with a dynamic model that it will be able to adjust up as well as adjust down as the business environment changes for your ServiceNow environment. So let's first talk about the product roadmap and how to develop a living roadmap that evolves over time. These are some, some, some common questions I hear from customers after go live. The are questions like, uh, what should I focus on next? I have hundreds of bugs and enhancements and requests on my team and I can't keep up. Other departments want to start using ServiceNow. Where do I start? And ServiceNow is releasing a new version, uh, usually twice a year. Should I upgrade and when should I upgrade? These are common questions, and if you've asked yourself the same, these same questions, um, or if you're asking yourself these same questions, you probably first need to look at your roadmap. And if you don't have a roadmap, one of the things, first things you need to do is either to create a roadmap or update your roadmap. Typically after go live and your user base community has started using ServiceNow for some period of time, they'll start to identify bugs as well as enhancements, things which they you know, want to see in future versions of, of ServiceNow. 
the double-edged sword with ServiceNow is the more successful you are implementing uh, ServiceNow at GoLive, the more likely that other functionality will want to be introduced, especially you know, if they're aware of the ServiceNow platform capabilities. You may have other organizations or other departments who are looking to migrate their own legacy applications to ServiceNow on top of the existing footprint which you implemented during your first GoLive. The key behind this is you can't possibly do everything all at once, nor should you try. I often hear customers tell me that, like I said, they have hundreds of requests that they can't keep up. Like I said, this is normal, and instead of tactically trying to close them like incidents one at a time, the better way is to build a strategic pro product roadmap to provide some strategic direction for your organization. For my customers, I typically build a three-phase roadmap. I have an example here on the right. Uh, the phases are, in this case, is broke up into three phases in terms of the short term, as well as a uh, second term and a, and, and a longer term roadmap. The first phase is really focused on things which you really need to do immediately and has some fairly high detail in terms of what it is and what it's going to take, while the second phases are um, a little bit further out and have uh, a little bit less detail. The purpose of the multi-phase roadmap is to publish this roadmap to your organization and set expectations on when certain roadmaps will be implemented. So that way, if after GoLive, for example, and you have this roadmap and someone says, okay, well, I see that in uh, Jakarta instance, ServiceNow has the automated testing framework. I really want to, you know, to you know, take advantage of that. If you have that on your roadmap, like we have here in our example, we're saying, okay, well, we understand we're going to start looking and considering that you know, in our April 2018 uh, release. And that way, you can do a little bit more strategic thinking and planning in terms of rolling out something like test management as opposed to trying to handle it like an incident and kind of close it out right away. I like to create themes for each phase of the roadmap. So you see in this example, this three-phase roadmap, the first phase I have here is the IT service management or ITSM theme. And the second theme which I have here is the facilities and IT business management. But if you look at the individual items in here, just because you have a theme for a particular phase, it doesn't mean that everything in that theme uh, needs to be uh, inclusive uh, for that topic. So for example, if you look at the facilities theme, which I built here as an example, it has three items in here which has to do with facilities, facilities service management, uh, some GeoJSON map integration, move management, but I also included two topics which are traditionally with ITSM, which are basically bleeding over from the first phase into the facilities theme, and that's vendor management and knowledge management for the end users. So. The focus on this particular theme could be facilities management, but that doesn't mean that you can't take on other topics that may be of a prioritization for your roadmap. So how do you know what items to put on your roadmap? You want to consider two different approaches. The first approach here is to mature your existing applications. So for example, if you started off with a ServiceNow quick start where you're doing an ITSM incident change problem, uh, maybe a CMDB light, and that went successful, your second phase may be to build upon that existing uh, scope. So you may be doing you know, additional CMDB, you may be doing some additional things around problem management and change management. Maybe you're going to be looking at doing you know, the standard change catalog or the CAB workbench. So in this particular case, your roadmap items would be expanding existing functionality that you already have implemented. And what you'll find a lot is that even after you go through GoLive and your users start using a particular application, even in something as core as incident or change management, 30, 60, 90 days, you should have enough items in there in order to um, you know, create a backlog in terms of what you can do in order to improve that particular application and really bring it to the next level of maturity. So it's not uncommon to see something like a service catalog or incident management be spanned across multiple level of phases simply because we're constantly trying to evolve these processes and make, them, make it a better experience for, for our users. The other roadmap consideration which you have is introdu introduction of new functionality. So this is functionality which isn't previously available to your uh, user community. 
So you may be adding in new applications that were not previously available. So for example, if you see in our roadmap here, uh, we're adding in facilities, uh, facilities management in the second phase, and we're really focusing on facilities service management and move management. Those would be uh, two brand new applications. Uh, you could be introducing new integrations, like we have here for our GeoJSON map integration, which you know gives you the, um, uh, the space maps that we can use with facilities. The other thing which you can kind of consider is that if you have legacy applications what you, that you want to migrate to ServiceNow, which requires some custom application development, those legacy applications are often really good targets in terms of um, things which you can kind of put in your roadmap, especially if it's something which you're looking to sunset in the near future. So here's, here's some uh, benefits of a product roadmap. Really, without a product roadmap, organizations will really struggle to keep up with the service now product demands. They'll have problems setting uh, expectations with their stakeholders and their organizations, and the de development teams um, are a lot of times not appropriately staffed to meet demand. Without a roadmap, some organizations will attempt to log service now enhancements as incidents. We'll be talking about a better solution for that uh, here in the next slide. And what this does, this creates the organizational perception that ServiceNow is broken uh, because they view that, oh, there's all these incidents which is being logged against the ServiceNow platform. And this is really subjecting ServiceNow to the incident management process. And when you think of uh, things like bug fixes and enhancements, some of those, yes, may be uh, actual bug uh, uh, bugs, but a lot of those really have to be, a lot of times in my experience, there'll be training opportunities as well as, you know, an enhancement request that people want to see out of the new platform, and it's really key that we differentiate the two. With a published roadmap, stakeholders have a less of a right now expectation on development, so they basically know, you know, what's on the horizon, what's a little bit further beyond in the advanced phases, and know really when, uh, when certain uh, items will be implemented. Stakeholders have a better understanding of the cadence and the capability of the team. We know we're doing a three-phase roadmap. We know that we're focusing on one theme uh, per phase. If you have a larger development team, we'll be talking about that. Maybe you're focusing on you know, two themes per phase, but this will set the expectations for the organization in terms of what's coming and how much is being done during each, each particular release cycle. Uh, the organization is able to align the roadmap items with business objectives, and that's really key is you want to make sure that whatever you're, you're putting on your roadmap is really for the benefit of the organization, and it really aligns to what you're trying to achieve as the business. So, for example, a lot of organizations would come to me and say, uh, Michael, I'm really interested in asset management because, you know, we have uh, issues in terms of, you know, being able to reduce our costs in terms of software license. And that has a very specific business objective as well as um, some specific goals, which would really make sense to be put on, put on, the, on the roadmap. And those are the types of things which you're kind of looking for. Additionally, we've run into some circumstances where people will say, you know what, I, I understand what your roadmap is, but I have this really high priority item, for example. They may say, you know, we have our, our marketing teams out there and we really need to get them to go live um, and they're not on your roadmap yet. And a lot of the times if something is a, that high of a priority, you can view this a lot of the time as being an opportunity to fund additional resources where you can say, okay, you're not on the roadmap right now because we're only building our roadmap based upon our current capabilities. But if they're willing to fund a project, we'll talk about you know some um, examples in terms of how to execute that, but if they're willing to fund a project and to staff it, you may be able to accelerate that particular topic or that particular roadmap item um, if they have the, the, the funding for that. What the roadmap does, it promotes a more deliberate preparation planning and design for the actual development. You want to make sure that you're not doing things last minute, but that you're actually collaborating with whoever's asking in terms of what needs to be fixed. Because a lot of the times, especially after go live, things which are quote unquote bugs, as I said before, they may just be training opportunities or things which people need to get you know adjusted or acclimated to. Or it may be that it does need to be something which needs to be addressed, but it needs to be addressed from you know a larger macro level as opposed to you know a tactical change you know on a form. And really what happens is that the more planning and design that you have before the actual development and collaborating with the people who are requesting it and understanding what the platform requirements and the platform impact is, the higher level quality of solutions that you're going to be able to deliver.
this next slide here is really about demand management. And what this has to do is that if you have a lot of uh, requests and bugs and fix enhancements which are coming into your ServiceNow team, demand management is actually a, a perfect vehicle in order to capture and to manage those types of requests. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, demand management is an application that is available you know, within ServiceNow. And the idea here is that you know, through a catalog item or even through the, uh, the UI, users can submit ideas. And those ideas can be um, grouped into demands and you can evaluate those de de demands are in terms of the risk and the value into the organization. So what you're seeing on the right is uh, just one screenshot of the demand management with a bubble chart, which you're able to really compare different ideas or demands which kind of come in and see which one really makes sense. The other things which you can kind of do with demand is you can do things like be able to size the um, uh, the effort for that particular item in terms of what it would take in terms of cost, in terms of effort. And really what this allows you to do is it allows you to be very strategic in terms of what, what you're going to be putting on your roadmap. You have a really good understanding in terms of what it's going to take to implement that roadmap item as well as what the benefit will be to the organization if you were to implement it and help out with the prioritization. Just some key things to remember about building a successful roadmap. The first thing about having a successful roadmap is really about developing a product owner and getting uh, the ServiceNow stakeholders and uh, leadership being able to review the, pro uh, the product roadmap. Uh, the product roadmap should be published, it should be visible, it shouldn't just be a, a um, document which is kind of tucked away in some, some sort of shared folder. We want everyone to have visibility in terms of what you're building on the ServiceNow platform, get people excited about that, as well as have people kind of contribute to, you know, you know, any sort of items which need to be, you know, added to that roadmap. This should be driven by the, the product owner, and we'll be talking more about, you know, what the product owner role is a little bit later. The product roadmap should be a living document, meaning that just because you built it once doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be updated. So typically I recommend is after each major release, you're gonna go ahead and you're going to update that roadmap to, to um, check off you know, the items which you've done, as well as look at the items which are next on the next phase in the roadmap. And you have to consider, okay, for the next phase, do I need to reprioritize roadmap items? Do I need to add new items to the roadmap? Do I need to consider some new features that are available in the latest release of ServiceNow? You want to review to ensure that the appropriate maintenance, staffing, and budget considerations are in place in order to support that roadmap. And we'll be talking about that. For example, if you're going to be introducing something like discovery in the next phase, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate staffing resources to support a discovery, not only implementation, but a maintenance, ongoing maintenance uh, after, after the go live. So the next topic which I want to talk about is the software development life cycle or STLC and really this is about creating predictable release cycles. So at this point with your product roadmap, you know what it is that you want to do, you have that published out to the organization, you really need an STLC uh, as a vehicle to help you to figure out, well, how am I going to implement this to make this a reality? And the first thing you want to do is really to establish a release schedule. And the release schedule which I usually recommend is basically to have at a minimum uh, two uh, regular release schedules. You basically want to have a, a maintenance release and in this example here I have a weekly maintenance release. Some organizations will do this on a, on a, a bi-weekly or a monthly basis as well as you want a major release or a roadmap item release and in this example I did a quarter release. The idea is, is that you're going to have a bunch of different maintenance items and these could be things as simple as okay I need to clean up some notifications, maybe there's some form views out there which need to be cleaned up, maybe I need to you know create some um, you know, reports. So those are the maintenance items things which will go on, on for a weekly basis and it's really going to be focusing on uh, maintaining your, your current scope. Your second release, which is your roadmap items, which is less frequent and in this case is quarterly, this is really about pushing your roadmap uh, forward. So that uh, product roadmap, which we just discussed, you're going to be taking uh, one of those phases and really executing on implementing that particular phase. And what you're going to need to be able to do that is to develop a cadence or develop a, a set of release activities uh, for both of these relate, uh, uh, release types. 
So for example, if you're thinking about, okay, well, I'm going to be doing a major release, how much time do I need in order to get requirements or gathering or user story development, as they call it in Agile? How much time am I going to need for actual development and in terms of what I need to do in terms of unit testing? And how much time do I need in order to do an update, update set promotion and UAT testing? What organizations find is that a lot of the times they'll come up with an SDLC, for example, and they say, okay, well, we're going to be doing uh, for a maintenance release 40 you know, FTE hours, basically one person you know, 40 hours a week. Fairly simple example. What they find in reality is that in order to actually execute and implement on that 40 full-time or uh, 40 hours a week, it really takes three calendar weeks in order to actually execute that because they need at least one week in terms of requirements and user story development, and they also need another week in terms of UAT testing, remediation, documentation, and training. So it's very, it's very critical to that you understand you know, what your exact cadence is and that you just don't incorporate the, the development perspective, but you also understand you know, what the other aspects are for the release. We'll talk about some of the major roadmap items a little bit later in terms of some of the roles, but one of the things to consider with major roadmap items, especially when you're looking at changes in terms of uh, the UI, which you know, typically happens um, maybe on a yearly or every other year basis with ServiceNow where people actually will see things different with the new release or maybe you're changing your process, there's going to be a aspect of, of organizational change management or OCM, and you're going to see that in our slideshow, where you're going to have to invest in the organization to be able to adopt the new process, to adopt the new UI. So there's going to be training and internal marketing campaigns and communication, which also needs to be um, delivered. And that really needs to be built into your release activities to make sure that you're successful. Uh, common organizations' expectations um, excuse me, common organizational expectations with no published SDLC, what do they kind of run into? Um, a lot of times they run into bug enhancement requests that are ignored or take too long because a lot of times people will focus on just a couple of bugs or enhancements or the other ones which are out there which they don't know. Um, they get a little bit delayed uh, without a good SDLC process. Without a good SDLC process, there's no expectation in terms of the duration. So when a user submits something, they don't know whether it's going to get uh, fixed tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, you want to make sure that, uh, uh, that you set an expectation in terms of you know, what the turnaround is for that. Um, the other uh, issue that you run into is that the management organization doesn't know what ServiceNow team is doing and when they're doing it. They know that they're busy, but they don't know what exactly that they're working on. Uh, without that SDLC, without that pro product roadmap, we can't say, hey, we're working on this particular phase which has these particular roadmap items. From a development perspective, uh, the team will have some challenges with no published uh, SDLC. The biggest challenge which I see from a lot of my customers without a mature SDLC is that the requirements which they're given uh, from their users or that they get in, uh, they're usually incomplete or in inadequate and they spend a lot of times going around trying to collect the right requirements or in a worst case, what they end up doing is they have to do multiple testing cycles or at the absolute worst case, multiple release temps or multiple tries because they just didn't get it right the first or second time. The idea is, is that, as I was saying before, the better planning and design you have, uh, the better chance you have of getting a, first, a higher quality solution the first time around. Other issues that you have is that without an SDLC, you're going to be more susceptible to duplicate requests. You're not going to have complete visibility to everything which is going on, especially if you're taking a, a first in, first out, just kind of working from the top of the list and, and, and moving your way down. You're not sure if someone else is working on the same thing or you know, maybe that's something which you guys have tried before, but you just don't have visibility to it. And this really kind of creates a reactive development um, environment as opposed to a strategic one. In terms of SDLC benefits, here are some uh, benefits you'll see with a mature SDLC process. The first one is organizational visibility to the ServiceNow team velocity. This is really going to tell the organization and leadership how much work your team can do reasonably and accomplish for each maintenance and uh, major release. You know, we talked about in terms of development hours, maybe you only can do 40 development hours of maintenance release a week. Maybe it's only 10 or 20, kind of, and we'll talk about you know, how you calculate that uh, out a little bit later. But the idea is that you want to make sure that the, that the organization has vis visibility to what your team is capable of. 
you also have visibility in terms of do you need additional resources to meet demand, especially if you know that this is the cadence which I'm setting up for the SDLC, uh, and this is the you know the product roadmap which the organization expects us to execute it. Do I have you know the the right number of resources, or maybe on the opposite, maybe you have too many resources, maybe you have too many administrators and not enough developers, where uh, some of your administrators are are idle and your developers are being um, uh, overworked. You want to make sure that you have a good ratio between uh, roadmap items and maintenance items. So as an SDLC, you want to make sure that you're maintaining your current scope as well as you're focusing on your product roadmap items as well. You want to make sure you have a, a, a good blend of, two, of both of those. The second benefit which you put on there is to manage product expectations. You want to make sure that you understand your team's cap capability and benefit to the organization, so that the or so the organization knows what you're doing and how it's benefiting the organization as a whole. As a whole, you want to make sure that the, that the process encourages collaboration with the requesters and the business units when developing solutions. So you want to work with the business units and with your requesters in terms of developing stories, doing storyboarding and mock-ups, um, and working together in terms of user access acceptance testing. Um, the last benefit uh, which we talked about is that the team knows what items to focus on and what items uh, must be delivered, but more importantly, what items are on the product backlog that they don't have to worry about right now. So it allows them to say, okay, that's something which is going on in phase three. We're going to worry about that when that phase comes, comes along. These are the items which I need to, to focus on for right now. So let's talk about some staffing models that you'll need in order to you know, maintain your current instance as well as some of those uh, project uh, roadmap items. First thing I want to talk about are some common staffing roles. Uh, these are some common staffing roles I see for most ServiceNow organizations. The one which I have on the top is a product owner. And I, I say that this is essential for, for all organizations. This is usually one named resource, one person. It's usually not you know, a multiple multiple people, it's not a committee, but really we want to pro have a product owner who's developing the product strategy, sharing that out with uh, leadership, and really is being the championship for, champion for the, for the ServiceNow platform. Now they may work with a larger committee or a, a service management organization or another governing body, but we want to make sure that we basically have someone who is uh, responsible for the ServiceNow platform as a whole to make sure that one, it's aligning with the business objectives as well as it um, maintains the platform integrity. The second role which I have here is the system administrators. And I say at a minimum, organizations should have at least one certified system administrator on staff, preferably two or more, really kind of depends on the size of your organization. I'll talk about that in a second. The role of the system administrator is to perform platform maintenance and day-to-day -day activities. So they're really about maintaining the current scope that you already have implemented. So if you did a phase one ITSM implementation, the expectation is that they're going to be able to maintain as well as provide some minor enhancements to that existing scope. The expectation is typically not that, oh, you know, that we're going to be introducing them to, you know, things like automated testing framework or GRC or performance analytics, those are roadmap items which typically um, system administrators, you know, would need uh, at least um, some, some, some additional resources to help to plan and to implement. The third role which I have here is the developer. Uh, so this is uh, for organizations that have expanding functionality in terms of roadmap items and really their their role is to extend the, the platform functionality. So it's to introduce those new applications, to extend the existing functionality, uh, build integration, that sort of thing. The fourth item on here is a business analyst. And the business analyst is really going to help you in a number of ways. One, they're going to help you with in terms of uh, document requirements, as well as really kind of help you lead with the uh, championship enablement or the organizational organizational change management uh, requirements that you have for your organization. So this is going to include things like internal marketing campaigns, training, documentation, as well as even on a more technical side, identifying whatever changes or what, whatever you're implementing, what is the organizational and platform impact that you need to prepare for and need to make adjustments to make sure that it has the, the mi most minimum impact to your organization. I threw this last one in only because I'm seeing it more and more, and um, I'm calling it a configuration librarian. I've seen it configuration administrator. Uh, the idea behind this particular role is that if you have a CMDB, and whether you're using 
uh, ServiceNow Discovery or using another discovery solution or service mapping, um, you're going to have to have someone who's going to be able to maintain the CMDB health and provide reconciliation and remediation of the CI objects. And that's really where the configuration library co librarian comes in. So for discovered objects, they're going to go ahead and uh, help out with um, maintaining those CIs, and then for the uh, ones which are not discoverable, maybe it's things like who owns particular services or you know who is the supporting group, uh, they'll help you to maintain those, those attributes as well. Here are some staffing options that we see very commonly uh, in the industry. The staffing options that we have here are in-house. This is probably the most basic. This is used for sustained administration and development. Uh, you have managed services, which is more third party. So this is also used for sustained administration development, but this is you know, usually a third party um, uh, firm that you're using. You have developer on demand. Some organizations will call this a virtual administrator. And this is really used to augment your in-house staff. Uh, the advantage of developer on demand, it allows you to dynamically adjust your team velocity. Uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility. And the last one which we have here is uh, project-based consulting. And project-based consulting is used to implement uh, new highly specialized functionality uh, against your roadmap items. And this is usually used for uh, projects where your in-house staff don't, may not have or they may not be up to speed on those specialized skill sets. When you're considering your staffing options, things which you want to take into consideration is what your current SDLC velocity is and what you anticipate your SDLC velocity is against your product roadmap. So you want to make sure that you understand, you know, am I going to have, um, you know, a maybe in the third quarter a uh, increased demand for you know development and in the fourth quarter it's going to go down well how am I going to adjust to that because in-house staff is you know fairly um, um, uh, sustained uh, but I don't want them to be idle for three months so you know can I backlog that with you know developer on demand or maybe put in project-based consulting so that's what you really want to do is in order to make sure that uh, you have you understand what your sustained velocity is as well as your anticipated velocity is in terms of your roadmap items as well as what your cost and budget is to fund each one of these staffing options so let's talk about creating a staffing model the first, the first step we have here is identifying a product owner. We talked about who a product owner uh, should be and what their uh, role is. The second item here is to identify the staffing needs based on the product roadmap in the SDLC process. The idea is that you want to quantify the planned demand for each roadmap phase. So Agile uses a system called points. You'll see that demand uses t-shirt sizing and other methods. Really any of those methods would work, but really you want to come up to say, okay, you know, for each, um, for each release, I know that I'm going to need, you know, 300, you know, points or five large t-shirts in order to kind of implement that. You want to be able to make sure that you can quantify that in terms of your roadmap so you can start to align what your, uh, align what your staffing requirements are. You want to build an SDLC process to support the demand from your roadmap as well as a recurring maintenance release. So you want to understand what is the velocity that I need in order to maintain my current instance. And maybe that velocity may be, oh, I need you know, 20 points or 40 points a week in order to maintain my, my current demand, and I need an additional 200 points in order to hit, hit the roadmap. Those are the types of things which you're trying to, trying to align in terms of your, of your SDLC. And the last thing on, or excuse me, the next thing which you want to do here is you want to budget according in alignment with both of these release types. Uh, the third item here is identify the required staffing roles. So once you have your, the understanding of your, pro, of your product roadmap and your SDLC process, you need to figure out how many admins do you need? How many developers? How many business analysts? Do I need other roles like a configuration librarian uh, in there in order to, uh, to, to, to meet those needs? And the fourth and last item here is to source your staff using the staffing options. Is now you have an idea in terms of how many of each different type of role. Well, am I going to staff them all in-house? Am I going to use managed services? Am I going to use project-based consulting? And this will actually all start to kind of come together and really kind of line up in terms of, you know, what your actual needs are. So let's start taking a look at some of the uh, staffing models which are out there. This first one which you see out here is what I call a baseline model. Uh, this is one and a half full-time employees or FTEs for a quick start implementation. And this is really about maintaining 
uh, and enhancing your current scope. So if you think of a quick start, it's usually you know incident change problem, a little bit of service catalog, and we're assuming that you're going to have a, a fairly fixed um, SDLC velocity in terms of maintaining that. So the idea here is that you're going to have at least you know one. Um, um, excuse me, you're going to have two system administrators, and in this case, you know, they're in-house. This is probably the most basic uh, staffing model, which you'll see. The idea here is that you're going to have 1.5 FTE in total, so both of these individuals are probably going to be a, a, a portion of, of their time. The second model is basically the, the same model as your baseline, but it's augmented with managed services. And this allows you to give you a little, little bit more flexibility. Because you're using a third party, you'll be able to, able to ratchet up or down the level of system administration you need. So this is still assuming that you're going to maintain your existing deployment scope, but it allows you some flexibility in terms of uh, being able to add or you know, remove um, administrators um, you know through your managed service provider the one of the advantages of using this model is that with most managed service providers you already get uh, trained preferably certified resources who have access also to other specialized resources so you don't have to worry about maintaining uh, your own administrators keeping them up to bit date making sure that they know the latest and the greatest they should already have all of their certifications as well as also have access to a pool of resources uh, that they can rely on this next staffing example is a in-house with augmented with a developer on demand or DOD the developer on demand or DOD staffing model contains an element of in-house administrator augmented with a DOD service that is really a pay-as-you-go model, um, sometimes uh, by the hour or by the bucket of hours. This model gives you the most flexibility where you can build dynamic adjust or you can dynamically adjust your velocity based on demand. While the previous managed service model also has flexibility, managed services uh, flexibility adjusts typically on a contractual or annual basis, while DOD can be adjusted um, almost um, dynamically on a month-to-month -month basis. As with the managed service pro model, this model also provides you with access to specialized resources as well as developers and architects who can uh, provide for product planning. Uh, this next model is an in-house model with your in-house developer. So this model is more indicative of an organization that has a very heavy product roadmap. It's a very aggressive roadmap. This model has in-house uh, administrator as well as multiple in-house developers. This is a fairly common approach that I see among my customers. The key in order to maintaining this particular model is to ensure that you have a sustained roadmap that justifies the headcount. I've seen in a lot of organizations which they'll say, okay, we're going to do phase one and phase two, but we're going to, uh, between, between phase two and phase three, we're going to take three months off to have like a burn-in period. And a lot of the times those developers will get allocated to other projects or in, you know, other extreme circumstances, you know, they may get, you know, bored and move on to other organizations. So the idea is, is that if you have in-house developers, you want to make sure that you have sustained velocity to really to kind of keep them engaged throughout the duration of the entire roadmap. This next uh, staffing model is really about a blend of in-house and the managed service. So that, again, this is for a heavy product roadmap. And I see this more commonly amongst organizations that have been using ServiceNow for, year, for years. This model has an in-house administrator and managed service provider developers. It has a minimal um, in-house FTE investment and the managed service providers will provide you with some flexibility in terms of the number of developers. However, like the previous model, you'll still need to justify the managed service uh, contract duration with the relatively sustained velocity for the duration of the contract. So if you have a year contract, you need to make sure that you're able to keep those developers for the, uh, busy for the duration of the contract. This last model I want to talk about is about project-based consulting, and this is really about uh, implementing your major roadmap items. So typical roadmap items usually contain brand new or complex functionality that in-house staff may only have minimal exposure to, or if it's new functionality, they may not have any exposure to it at all. Project-based consultants bring in experienced specialists for the project to accelerate development cycles that are typically difficult to achieve by in-house or even managed service providers. 
The key to a successful project-based consultant and the biggest risk is to ensure that the development efforts performed by the project consultants include good documentation. This includes release notes, training, and knowledge transfer to in-house resources. So in this particular example, you'll see that while there's project-based consultants, there's still an element of in-house developers to uh, perform the knowledge transfer to. Um, So this next slide really talks about how we're going to be talking about retaining ServiceNow resources. Uh, there is a three steps which we have here, and really the first thing is, is creating the right staffing model to ensure that you have, one, efficient use of your budget, an opt optimized mix of resources between administrators, developers, business analysts, as well as a good mix in terms of what your service options are, whether they're in-house, managed services, DOD, and project-based consulting. You want to make sure that you minimize your over and under allocation of resources and that your resources stay engaged for the duration in which they're intended to. You want to make sure that they, they, they don't remain idle and that they have an understanding of what the product roadmap items are and that they're preparing uh, to, to execute on those product roadmap items. The second step here is you want to align staff with the roadmap items to keep the re resource, resources engaged. So you want to make sure that if there are upcoming topics or up up upcoming training that your staff will need, you want to make sure that you're preparing for them uh, ahead of time so by the time that that uh, phase of the roadmap arises that they'll be prepared to execute that. You want to make sure that the SDLC process is there to ensure that the development, that you have efficient development and that it's optimized for the team velocity. The last step here is you want to keep your staff engaged. So some of the recommendations we have to keep your staff engaged is to have them attend a regional SNUGs or ServiceNow user groups, uh, keep them active in the ServiceNow community, uh, provide them with uh, training opportunities. ServiceNow has a number of training opportunities and changing topics. A lot of them are, are virtual, so uh, they can do that from their own desk. Uh, participate in the knowledge conference, as I mentioned previously. The next one will be in May next year in Las Vegas, as well as uh, Participate and have them um, involved in developing your product roadmap so they basically have input and they have understanding in terms of what's, what's coming up in terms of the platform. So in summary and conclusion, building a staffing model is really about um, creating or really building these three elements of uh, the product. Uh, these three elements that you're seeing here, the product roadmap, the SDLC, and staffing. For example, you might want to establish that your product roadmap requires a quarter release of 300 development points, and you build an aligned SDLC process to support the quarter release plus a weekly maintenance release of 75 points. Taking into account the complete SDLC cycle, the staffing requirement could be that you need one and a half administrators and two developers. Any planned or unplanned changes to any one of these elements will have the direct impact on the other two. So for example, if one of your, if one of your developers you know, moves on to another project or to another group, this is going to directly affect what your velocity is as well as your ability to execute on the roadmap. And if that's going to remain permanent, you need to make sure that you, re you reset adjustments as well as republish your roadmap and adjust your SDLC that people have an understanding in terms of uh, what your current capabilities are. Well, that's it, which I had today for the product roadmap, or excuse me, for the um, for the staffing. Uh, thank you for everyone for attending this webinar. I hope you found this information useful, and I'd like to open up the floor back up to Pete. So thanks, Michael, for that. I think we've got a bunch of questions that came through. Um, I think at this point, uh, given the velocity of questions, we will most likely answer those directly to the folks who have reached out to us. Um, just because there's so many questions that have been posed. Uh, if you have other questions, uh, Michael, you want to advance the slide um, to the next one here. Uh, please reach out to this email address. Uh, we will get your questions that way. Uh, you can also reach out to me directly, pspear at, at covestic.com. Uh, I would like to just, just shameless plug around Covestic. We, we are involved heavily with uh, project work, as many, many of you know. We also have a virtual support service called Developer On Demand, which can help augment uh, your staffing teams uh, with a virtual support subscription service, which is really a, a per hours, uh, sort of a bucket of hours per month model. Uh, more than happy to, to uh, discuss that with you uh, if you're interested in that. 
Um, but uh, at this stage, we'll, we'll uh, conclude the webinar. We, thanks for your, your time, everyone, for joining. And please feel free to reach out for any other uh, information you need from us.